Okay. Right, right, my name is David Cahoon, and I'm here to do a little interview with Rosie Sexton, whom I've known since 2011, I guess, judging by my Twitter account, my email account. And I'm doing it because she seems to me to be a remarkable person. Well, she, she has had three main interests, perhaps, in music, mathematics, and then mixed martial arts. And she's better at all of those things than I ever was. Yet somehow I ended up as a professor in a fancy university. And uh, this puzzles me. So I, I'd just like to dig a little more into her background, especially her early background. Her martial arts career is very well documented already. So let's see what happens. Okay. <laughs> so let's start at your primary school. Mm. What were you interested in maths and music then? Yes. I'm I mean, I've been trying to remember how old I was when I started learning the piano. I think I could do the adding up, and you know, when I was you know, really tiny. And then, as I got older, I started getting into um, you know, more more involved puzzles and things like this. When I was at primary school, I was actually involved in a project um, that where kids who had a particular interest in maths. I don't think it was ability so much, it was more um, people who were, were keen on it. Um, spent one day a fortnight doing maths related activities on a, a workshop at, uh, at another school somewhere and this was always very exciting and there was a residential course that, um, associated with that. So I think, I think all of those things kind of got me um, got me excited about about it and then that sort of developed from, from one thing to another I went through secondary school I think mm. well that's pretty impressive because it there must be some talent there though I mean our son started playing the violin quite young um, but he, <laughs> he didn't really ever take to it I think <laughs> I think different instruments sort of a, um, with with the piano particularly. I, I think certainly in my case, I, I, I wouldn't want to speak for people in general, but I think in my case, it definitely was the triumph of persistence over um, any kind of natural ability. I don't think. I mean, I, certainly my perception is that I don't have any particular uh, natural inclination towards it. It's just that I've been doing it long enough and spent enough time. I think, I mean, this is a general theme in my life, actually. I think that, you know, I don't have any particular natural aptitude for a lot of these things. It's just that I've, um, if, if I have a natural aptitude for anything, it's being persistent and uh, plugging away at something. And, uh, and I think seeing that's meant something, that, yes. Um, seeing something which other people regard as near impossible and deciding to do it, well, is my impression. I think. I, th I think it's that idea of sort of I mean, just progressing in small steps and, and keeping, keeping at it rather than... Um, I mean, the thing is, because I never really... I, d I, don't, I don't remember ever having that experience of just sitting down to something and picking it up immediately and uh, I, can, I can just do this, this is great. So, uh, um, I mean, for example, when I watch my son play sport, you know, he'll he'll play a new sport that he's never played before, and he'll just pick it up, and he'll, you know, and, it, and he'll be good at it straight away. And it, this is infuriating because I was never like that. I definitely wasn't with sport. I don't think I really was with, uh, with music or maths either. Um, it was always something that I had to, I had to work at. But I think perhaps because of that, I got used to the idea that this was just how things were, and you know, you only got good at things by doing lots of it. Um, and I think, if anything, that's possibly a more useful skill set to uh, to acquire. Yes, yes. Because my my, although I've been fascinated by maths all my life, I did badly at school at it, and I really only started to learn it later on mm. from from uh, 
good colleagues like yeah, Hyman Kesselman, and Matthew Kesselman, textbook each solve all the linear algebra, prob algebra problems over lunch that I couldn't understand. But that, that was a terribly sort of amateur approach. I didn't have anything like your I think, well, professionalism. I, I think, I think the, the difficulty with, with maths is that a lot of the time it is presented in a way in, I mean, in much the same way we were talking about with the piano, I think the early stages can be quite dull, mm. depending on how it's presented. Mm. Um, and I think I was actually quite fortunate that I had the opportunity to do, for example, this maths workshop at primary school, which sort of introduced us to a lot of applications and the, the more interesting side of, the, of, of maths, so the, the problem-solving aspect to it. So it wasn't just a question of you know, going through this set of operations where you're going to multiply two numbers together or things, which I think is the experience a lot of people have when it comes to maths. And that's, I think that's really unfortunate because you miss out on actually the thing that makes it interesting. Um, and maybe I was just lucky to have that experience early on, which motivated me to, to persist with it a bit more. Um, so even at secondary school when there was a lot of, I mean, th there is always a lot of r rote learning, if you like, involved in sort of learning to perform your, the operations and to do the, do the basics. Um, but then it's being able to apply that to, to solve these problems. And that's the bit that where, where it starts to become interesting. So I think, like I say, I, th I think that's what, what drew me to it in the first place, is sort of knowing what you can do with it. Um, I th in a way, it's sort of the, the, the same with music. It's when you start to see what you can use it for, what you can, what you can play with it. Um, and then that, it becomes inherently rewarding. Um, yeah, I think the talent must be, though, to, to stick to it through those early boring stages. I had very much the ex mm. similar experience, I think, with physics and chemistry. Mm. I found them really quite boring. Suddenly the idea of valence mm. clicked in my mind. Yes. Suddenly, oh, this is quite neat, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You sort of, I think you get to a particular point. And I think this is one of those things that maybe some people miss these days, is that it's not about finding something that you're immediately going to take to and find fascinating straight away. I think sometimes you have to do something for a while before it becomes interesting. Yeah. Um, and then sort of get through the... I mean, you, you can be inspired by what you want to do with it eventually. But I think there comes a point when you're learning anything where it gets really dull. Um, and I th if, if you stop doing it once you get to that point, you, you never get past that. Hurdle. I think it's only when you get out the other side of it that it, you start to really appreciate the value of it. Yep, yes, yep, I, I can see all of that. So at secondary school, I have heard you say that you weren't entirely happy all the time, uh, <laughs> like, uh, like a lot of kids. I, I, think, I think I struggled socially when I was at school. I think it... Um, I mean, uh, social skills, again, is an another thing that I definitely didn't take too naturally. Um, I think I've got better at that over the years. Um, in, so I think, certainly when I, was, when I was a youngster, I was very socially awkward. Um, and I mean, maybe I've just learned to manage that a bit better. But I think that made things very difficult. And I, I don't think that makes me unique by any means. I think a lot of teenagers go through that. Um, I, I wasn't naturally social or naturally gregarious and because of that sometimes I, I struggle to make friends. I, um, I think, I mean again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I get on much better with many of my former classmates nowadays than I, I remember doing back at the time. And I think it's, you know, we, it probably helps that you know we're all grown ups now, and uh, I mean teenagers in general um, are, are just uh, um, I think a whole bundle of insecurities sometimes. Oh yes, um, mm. yes. The and, parenting uh, stops being so much fun once they, um, <laughs> in well, my experience. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think I think the challenges are different. Um, I think different. it's uh, yes. Um, I've, I, I think it's 
it's what I mean. This is digressing a little bit, but when it comes to raising children, I think it's uh, just when you think you've got the hang of it, it all changes again, uh, which is uh, which is what keeps it interesting, right? <laughs> yep. Um, <coughs> But um, perhaps it went a bit further, though, because you, I heard you say once that you actually did some self-harm, which is, uh, seems extreme for... Well, I think... Like, um, I think a lot of teenagers go through a phase where they're not very happy with... Uh, themselves, the world, their place in the world. Um, I think, I mean, again, it's, it's sort of difficult to, to think back into sort of mindset at the time. Um, I mean, I know I, I suffered a lot of um, anxiety when I hit those teenage years, particularly. I think that was something that uh, I remember. Um, and again, that I think that probably didn't help when it came to... Uh, sort of fitting into social groups and making friends and things like that. And I think that was, uh, it was, it was a difficult period, shall we say. I mean, not, not universally by all means. There were, there were lots of things that I have very positive memories of from that period, but I think there, were, there was a, a lot that was, that was So you took up Taekwondo at 14. Yes. Was, was that connected to your mental state. I mean, you could, you could even maintain there was an element of self-harm in doing contact sports. I, I think, I mean, that happened sort of almost on a whim. Um, I think I had this idea that I'd like to learn some self-defence. Uh, and I, there, I saw an advert for a local Taekwondo club and I thought, that sounds like a, a nice thing to have a go at. Um, it was, in fact, it was my brother who tried it first. He, uh, I think my parents I mean, sort of suggested it might be something that he was in, into. Um, so he went and had a go, and then I decided to go along. And I ended up sticking with it, and he didn't. Um, but, uh, I mean, I did find that actually, because I, I'd never really got on with sport at school, I think, because most of the sports are team sports. And that's something that, again, I didn't, I didn't find very easy. Um, I mean, ball sports were never really my forte, um, but I think taekwondo, for some reason, was just a form of physical exercise that um, that I found that I really enjoyed doing it, um, and I think that that was definitely helpful. That was something that I found um, helpful for my mood and mental state in general. Um, I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I persisted with it. Um, I got the bug for it, if you like, um, and then uh, sort of went from there, really. Yes, I, I think persistence does seem to be part of your nature, whatever you do, which is uh, sort of fascinating for me to see. In this school, we had rugby and boxing, mm. and that was. Uh, I, I, in fact, I enjoyed those more than I enjoyed the school. Mm, <laughs> you yeah. seem to manage to enjoy everything. Well, I mean, I, I definitely <laughs> didn't. I, I definitely didn't get on with PE at school. Certainly not, um, not sort of in my early teens. I think later on, I, I maybe started to take to it a little bit more. Um, but I had this picture of myself that I wasn't sporty, um, perhaps because I'd sort of. Um, pigeonholed myself as the nerdy kid, you know, I was the one who was, had my head stuck in a textbook. Um, and it might have been people around me as well who were sort of saying, oh, she's good academically, but she's not really sporty. Um, and I think because I had that sort of self-image, maybe that was one of the reasons why I didn't really take to, to sport. I mean, these days, like I say, I'll, I'll play any sport you know, or I'll, I'll have a go at most things, and I'll enjoy having a go, even if I'm not particularly good at it. But back then, I think it was something that I, I, I didn't particularly take to. Um, it was only sort of after I got involved in martial arts and sort of found the, the benefits of physical activity through that, if you like, that I started to appreciate the other sports a bit more. Uh, Yes. 
so you were also keeping up your music in your secondary school, very much so, in fact, weren't you? You reached grade eight in piano, that's pretty high. What age was that at? I think I must have been 16, 17, something like that. Um, was somewhere around there, I can't remember exactly when it was. Um, I, mean, I also played, I started playing the cello in secondary school and I played in Reading Youth Orchestra and School Orchestra. Um, and again, I mean, the difference there is because it was, um, it was easier to, to play in groups and things with the, mm. um, which is something that I definitely, definitely enjoyed doing. Um, uh, yes, well, my wife found the same thing. She had mm. her first instrument in, in, at the um, mm. Royal College, or was it the Royal Academy, actually? I still can't remember, and she's not here right now. <laughs> but uh, piano is by far her best instrument. But, uh, yes, she, I, I, she continued yeah. to play the oboe simply because you could do it yeah. with other people. Yeah, I think I think the, the piano I was I was better at. Um, it sort of felt more natural to me. Um, maybe because I started earlier. I don't know. So. I guess the piano, your licentiate of the London College of Music. Associate. 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 Um, okay. so I, d I didn't get as far as a licentiate. <laughs> it was the next one. Oh, I see, right. Yeah. So the subtle grading is how I yes. wasn't aware yes, of. Yes, yes. Um, uh, but but, but um, that must have been your sort of first advanced qualification, I guess. Yeah, um, that's... Uh, Yes, that was, it was, I, I think it was, it was the year before I left school, I think, that I did that. Um, and, uh, Achieved at 
at A-level. Um, so then you went to Cambridge. Yes. The, how, how did you find Trinity College? I find it incredibly daunting. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was quite intimidating. It was quite intimidating. Um, I think, I mean, this is what they always say about going to Cambridge, um, is you've got all these um, kids who were inevitably sort of top of their class at school. They're doing really well. They uh, were highly successful. And suddenly you put them in an environment where everyone else is just as bright and just as successful and just as intelligent, if not more so. And all of a sudden, it, you're sort of a, you're a small fish in a very, very big pond. Um, and I think that came as a bit of a shock to the system. I think even when you're ready for that, even when people tell you to expect that, um, I think that can come as a bit of a shock. Um, yes. And I think that's certainly the first year that I, I remember um, finding it again quite very stressful because it's sort of that feeling of because before I knew certainly with maths if I worked hard enough I'd, I'd be able to do it you know, it's, it's just a question of putting putting the time in um, whereas I think I found sort of in that first year there was a lot of things that I, I could work really hard and I'd still find it tough um, and there, then you'd look around you and you'd see all these people who um, appeared to be just sort of breezing through it and going, oh, <laughs> uh, yes. it's a whole other level. Um, so I think that's when you start to think, oh, hang on a sec, this thing that I thought that I was really good at, I'm actually quite average. Um, and well, his yeah, predecessors a, like Isaac Newton, a, Bertrand mm, Russell, yeah, John Maynard yeah, yeah. Keynes, G.H. Hardy, mm. not to mention Ramanujan. <laughs> yes, I think when you, when you start comparing yourself to the people who who really are absolutely top of the tree, you sort of get, start thinking, oh, I don't know. And then that's that thought of, oh, what, what am I doing here? Yeah. Um, and that, uh, Imposter, sy sy imposter syndrome kicks in, and uh, that's uh, yeah. So uh, I think those were. I mean, it's the way I describe it to people is it's a bit of a pressure cooker. Um, Absolutely, yeah, I'm sure. Well, your tutor was Tim Gowles, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, he was. He was excellent. He was uh, uh, really I, good. Really sadly, good. I never met him when he was at yeah. UCL. Though I, yeah, uh, I, I love his uh, blog post about Elsevier, my part in its downfall. No. The dog is not complete yet, but it probably will be. Yeah. Oh, he, he's, a, yes. he's a good person apart from the man. Yes, yeah. No, he, he's, he was lovely, Tim. Um, he has a, I definitely, uh, definitely fell on my feet there. Um, yes, well, he's also a field medalist, isn't yeah. he? So, so it's a pretty high-class mm. stuff. I, I'm slightly puzzled about why you, you haven't got a first at Trinity, you didn't keep on with anything mathematical. It, it seems such a, a valuable talent in all sorts of spheres. Well, um, I went on to do, I did part three maths, um, mm. which is now retrospectively been upgraded to, graded to an M math. Um, mm. And then I did another master's in mathematical logic at Manchester. Mm. Um, I did that because it was, I think it was the only course of its of its type at the time. Um, but there, I got interested in um, some aspects of theoretical computer science. Um, I went on to do a PhD in that. Mm -hmm. um, And I think by the time I got to the end of the PhD, I, while I really enjoyed doing maths and getting my head stuck in a problem and sort of thinking about that for you know, weeks at a time, I started to realise that it maybe wasn't 
always very good for me. Because I think, because I'm naturally quite a solitary sort of person, it's very easy for me to sort of get buried in a problem and then not really interact with people and um, become quite, um, quite insular, if you like. Um, I think sort of spending, you know, days on end sat in front of a, a computer screen or, you know, a, 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 a pile of papers, um, I think... I found that that was maybe not the best thing for my for my mood, for my mental state. Um, I mean, at the, at the same time, um, this was when I started getting involved quite seriously in um, in mixed martial arts, um, and uh, I think more and more I started seeing that as my outlet, and um, that was something that I would look forward to doing because it made me feel good. Um, mm -hmm. and at the same time, I started realising that actually I was fairly good at this. Um, again, because I've been doing it for a while, I trained quite hard because I enjoyed doing it. Um, and I started to wonder, you know, how good could I get at it? Um, I'd done a few little competitions and things and I'd done reasonably well. And I, I enjoyed the, the buzz of that. Um, and, and I think that that was what prompted me to, uh, to to spend a bit more time doing that, and to and to want to take that seriously. So by the time I got to my the end of my PhD, I thought, well, okay, let's let's give this a year or two. You know, I want to do this for a bit, prove to myself I can, and then I can get on with the rest of my life. And you know do what I'm going to do, you know, I've got the rest of my life to sit in front of a computer. Um, you don't have that long when it comes to, you know, a sporting career. So why not do it now while I've got the chance? And um, I think that was the thing that sort of got me in that, going in that direction in the first place. Um, and then obviously once I'd taken a few steps down the rabbit hole, um, I started to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to see how far I could take it, really, and it just sort of went from one... I think going back to when I was a kid, it wasn't so much the shyness, it was, it was being afraid. And just being, being afraid of people. If I get really, really good at everything, then people will like me. I think, I think the thing that I've got out of fighting, though, is that I've learnt a lot of things about myself. It's enabled me to look at all these parts of myself and, you know, even just to be able to say what I'm saying now. Um, I think the experiences I've had have really helped with that. Because it's given me an insight into how I tick. It was, it was quite surreal in a way, because when I started, you know, it was this tiny niche sport that nobody really knew about um you know, having competitions you know in the some sports hall or a club somewhere um and you know it's this small community on the internet um and then over the time that i was involved with the sport it grew from that to being something that was almost mainstream you know everyone uh, talked about it, it was on satellite channels everything. and you know I started to get interviews in some of the mainstream news channels and that was something that I never really anticipated when I got into it. Um, the, the sport grew up around me. Um, so but you were never tempted, even if you didn't want to do a research career in maths, you could have taught it for example? Or yeah, I mean, I, I did, for a long time, I, I thought about going back to doing something with that. I mean, I always, I suppose, I imagined growing up that I was going to end up working in maths or science or computing somewhere. Um, and I don't, like I say, for a long time, I, do, I did think about that. Um, but then I think the other thing that came along was I started getting interested in sports injuries, because obviously, being around <laughs> had, them a lot, had <laughs> um, I had a few myself. My training partners had some. I, it seemed that you know everyone I talked to had something going on. So at first it was just a you know it was one of those things. I just started reading up on it out of interest and you know for the purposes of helping myself to deal with them better. And 
things like that. And again, it's one of those things that just went from one thing to another. The more I read, the more I realised there was to know and that I didn't know, um, and I wanted to, to find out more about it. Um, and again, eventually, I, uh, I decided that I wanted to take that seriously. So I had to go back to university um, and study in a clinical field. So that's, uh, that's what, I wanted, what I ended up doing. Um, and I think while I was doing that, I realised that actually that was something that I, I really enjoyed doing. I enjoyed the process of it. Um, and sort of working one on one with with people, and um, uh, basically helping people to to do the things that they want to do, um, and get back to the the activities and the sports that they they enjoy. And I think because sport and martial arts had been such a big thing in my life, and I found it so helpful. Um, from a mental health point of view, as well as uh, um, you know, as well as something I enjoyed, um, I think I recognised that that was something that applied to a lot of people. A lot of people sort of regard physical activity and sports as, as that outlet, um, and a lot of these people, you know, they'd go to um, some doctors or you know some healthcare professional, and they'd be they were getting told. You know, they they said, "Oh, I can't do I can't do my sport because my knee hurts." They very often get the answer, "Well, stop doing it then." Yes. And very often they'd be that that would be the the default. Oh, well, if it hurts, don't do it. Um, and I think for me, I found that really frustrating. Um, I was like, "Well, I need to do this because it's it's something that's important to me. Um, so I I need to find a better answer." I think that was the, the driver behind that. Um, I think. Uh, yes, you said you didn't want to sit behind a computer all your life, but the sort of maths you ended up doing mm -hmm. is not the sort you can do on a computer. It's the most abstract. Sort no, of no. I mean, a, a lot, a lot of it is pen and paper stuff. I, th I think. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, aside from you know, typing things up and everything, a lot of it is the sort of thing that you do with a stack of paper and a pencil. Um, but uh, I think, more to the point, it's something I, di I didn't want to spend the rest of my life sitting behind a desk, was I think the uh, yes. thing. Um, and again, it's not because I don't enjoy doing the maths, but I think, again, I found that I think there's a difference between enjoying something and recognising that it makes it, and it being good for you in a, in a wider sense. And I think I recognised that I enjoyed it, but it wasn't necessarily good for me. Um, yes. Uh, can you explain your thesis in 60 seconds? <laughs> 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 because, you know, I, I reckon I was, uh, as amateur mathematicians go, not too bad. I don't know about partial differential mm -hmm. equations and matrix algebra. That. But looking at your thesis, I can't get past the first page. It's a totally unfamiliar area to me. Yes, um, I th my, my thesis was in point-free topology, sometimes known as pointless topology, and you can draw your own conclusions from that. <laughs> um, uh, it's um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how enlightening it would be to, 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 to go through. Uh, <laughs> go on, have a go. Because I, I, I never um, heard you do it. And I'd, I'd love to. Let me, let me, let me think about it. It was, long, it was also a long time ago now. Um, so I'm slightly hazy on some of the details. I, I sometimes get my thesis out and I look at it and go, oh, that sounds intelligent. Um, <laughs> did I really do that? Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, um, it was to do with, you can take a topological space and you can look at the collection of open sets on that topological space. So if you throw out all the points, of the space and just look at the collection of open sets, that forms a particular structure called a frame. Mm -hmm. And there, 
is a relationship between the um, the category of frames and the category of topological spaces, and there's um, <clears throat> there's a conjecture that that one particular property of a, a, that, that a frame can have corresponds to a particular property of a, a topological space. Okay. And my thesis was essentially about coming up with a counterexample to this one particular conjecture. Um, and there was some stuff around the edges there, but I mean that was basically the original um, result that I came up with was a counterexample to this uh, this conjecture. Um, um, that, that, that's that was that was my tiny piece of a tiny area of a tiny. <laughs> In, um, which is what PhDs are essentially. Oh, PhD. um, but, uh, Every PhD is that. But yes. The, uh, can you discern any relation to computer science in that? Um, I mean, basically, it's related to domain theory, which, as I understand it, is to do with um, uh, there's a there's a relation there to, to proving that certain computer programs will do what they say they do. Um, now, I don't follow the exact details of the application because I wasn't really looking at that. I was looking at sort of the abstracted um, sort of a problem in the area in, in the area of the the abstract version of this. Um, but I'm told that there is a relationship there. As people who are more familiar with the the practical elements of uh, of of that area of computer science can probably uh, elaborate further. Yes, because it's about as far as you can get as filling in Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like, so, I mean, it, I mean, it's. It, it, I said that officially my PhD is in computer science. It's actually maths. Um, it just happened to have been funded by the computer science department, really. Um, so. Yes. So I see the paper you published had eight citations, which for a maths paper is actually pretty good. I was quite surprised to hear that, actually. I was, uh, um, yes, that's, uh, in fact, I should probably go back and read some of those now. Um, <laughs> there you are, you see, you can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Hmm. So you retired at, in 2014 from mm -hmm. martial arts. Reach the peak, really. Um, so you're age 37 then. 37 was the last time I was. Obviously, when my level was so much lower than mm. yours, in that as in most things. But um, so concerning your osteopathy. Some of my more sceptical friends find it quite offensive that I'm going to ask you about. But then there are serious questions as to mm -hmm. how much can be done. And the state, it, it, this is not re restricted to osteopathy at all. It seems to me that the state of medical mm. knowledge as a whole is it actually exceedingly rudimentary? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, no, I, th I think it's really just at the yeah. beginning of it. Yeah. It's only been going for a hundred years or so, after all. So yes, and it's rather complicated. Yes, and I think that there are a lot of things we don't know, and I think that becomes more apparent. The more of the research you read, the more it becomes apparent that you know what this doesn't actually tell us very much of anything. Um, and I mean, it, it's again, it's very small pieces of the puzzle, and they're absolutely valuable and absolutely, you know, it's essential that we do it. But I think looking at it in context, you know, there are there, we have small islands of knowledge in, you know, vast seas of igno ignorance. Um, so I think when we, when you're looking at that, that's uh, it's a very difficult area. And I think as clini clinicians, we're trying to apply what we can of those small islands of knowledge to the person in front of us. Um, and the, one of the difficult things with this is because every person is different. And I think you can, you can look at 
what the research says about you know people with back pain in general or people with knee pain in general or whatever um, but then you've got to figure out how that relates to that person who's who's sitting in front of you and what what will help them or what might help them um, so I think trying to trying to translate um, that that research literature into sort of a a useful plan of action for um, for your patient. I, I think that's that's where the um, the difficulty arises with any of these things. And I think um, that's uh, it. It is very much an imperfect science. Yes. Um, well, the problem of responders and non-responders mm -hmm. is widely abused, I think, and said essentially unsolved in most cases. Yes. You read yeah. about it in mm -hmm. every field, not least in drugs. And there are a few examples, like mm -hmm. in breast cancer mm -hmm. drugs, where mm -hmm. mutations have been identified that mm -hmm. do allow a certain amount of personalization. Mm -hmm. They're very rare, those things. Most of the talk of that is just hype. Well, I think, I think when we start talking about pain, we get into a slightly different area because pain is inherently subjective in the same way that enjoyment is inherently subjective. You know, different people, uh, you know, if I want to relax, I'm not going to go to a concert with lots of loud music that's full of people. But there are plenty of people who will. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they, they find that enjoyable, they find that relaxing. Um, now, if we did a randomized double blind control, or you can't double blind it very easily, but if we did a randomized controlled trial that assigned people to a loud music condition or a, some kind of control condition, you know, we might find that actually loud music doesn't enhance in enjoyment, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so do we then tell people, oh, you shouldn't go and listen to, go to loud concerts because the evidence says that it won't improve your enjoyment? Yes, and that, that's, a, that's a good example of how ridiculous yes. it can be. Yes, um, because but I mean, if, if that person says, "Well, I enjoyed it," we can't ver we, we can't tell them, "No, you didn't," because the evidence says otherwise. Absolutely. And not. I think the same to some extent, the same is true of pain, because pain is a subjective experience, like enjoyment. And if somebody says, "My pain is better." You can't very well turn around and say to them, no, it's not, because the evidence says you're wrong. <laughs> Absolutely, um, you can't. No, of course, of course so you can't. So I think this is, and this is where a lot of the research becomes very difficult, because research into any kind, anything that's so inherently subjective. And with breast cancer, there are things you can measure. You know, yeah. if that cancer goes into remission, you can, you can quantify this. Um, with pain... We're relying on people to tell us, okay, so on a scale of one to ten, how much pain are you in right now? Yeah. And when you start using that with patients, you start to see how difficult it is for people to give you sensible answers. So oh, I'll yes. have people who'll say, oh, it's about a six. And I'll go, okay, so that's about the same as last week, because you said it was a six last week. And they go, oh, no, it's definitely better than last week. I go, but it's still a six. And they go, it's a, de it's a less painful six, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I actually have that conversation, um, and it, it, quite often. Um, but then, when you think about it, these are, this is the scale that we're using to measure this mm -hmm. when we do the research. I'm sure. Um, oh, yeah, which, absolutely. like I say, I, I think is, is hugely problematic, but we don't have a better way of doing it. Um, so I think, um, yeah, like I say, I mean, when... I mean, what, what I tend to find is that a lot of it come, does come down to trying to work with that person and trying to figure out what success looks like to them. And like I said, sometimes it's not even about pain. Sometimes, for some of my patients, it's about when can I get back to doing my sport. Yeah. Um, I'm not, the, the, the pain isn't enough to bother me, but I want to get back to doing my sport, and my doctor says I can't, so what can you do for me? And that, again, is a whole different question. So what you're looking at is the, the goals of that person in front of you. So I don't, it's, it's not just about getting people out of pain. It's about, uh, 
um, well, the, the problem there is, is more to from it the research yeah. point of view, was to know whether the treatment that you gave this particular individual was responsible for their change in pain, or whether the uh, change in pain would yes. have happened anyway. Yes, <laughs> and I mean that's a, that's a, that's a horrendously difficult question to answer, uh, isn't it? Yes. And by and large, yeah. answered. I think it, 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 yes. it, it's mostly yes or I think still. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. 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 I, I agree. Um, I think, I mean, there are times when, you know, if you, you do something and that person stands up and they go, ah, that's better now. Uh, it's, it's, there's a, there's a, an immediate improvement mm. from that thing. I think it's not unreasonable to think that what you did may have had something to do with that. Yeah. If they come back a week later and they go, uh, I think it might be a bit better, yeah. obviously that's a, that's, um, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, t I tend to, my view is that if somebody isn't sure, if it's, if it's not clear, then that's a no. Um, I, I take that, you know, so if somebody has to think about it, yeah, so it probably isn't making, it, or, you know, that probably hasn't made a significant difference at this stage. And I mean, there's obviously things like, you know, with, sometimes with exercise programs, they're not, that's not going to work immediately, you know, it's something that, um, We've got to to try and look at over the over the long term, and then we've got to look at you know well, what do we know about this condition? What do we what can we be or what do we have more confidence that it may respond to? And then we build around that for that particular person. So I mean, it is it's, it's very much looking at it on an individual basis. And I think it's very difficult to say, right, you've got this kind of knee pain, so we're going to give you a standard, there you go, that's mm. a standard intervention, and we're going to apply that, and we're going to see what happens. It's, you know, it's, it, I, I, think, I think there's inevitably more to it than that. Um, yes. Uh, one can't help being biased by one's own mm. experiences in these things. Absolutely, yes. I mean, about a couple yeah. of months before... Yeah. Um, in 1987, mm -hmm. when before the London Marathon, mm -hmm. I suddenly started to get some knee pain, which I'd mm. never ever had before. Yes. Uh, and I, I got the yeah. entry, mm -hmm. three goes even in 1988 to get an entry into yes. the London Marathon. And I really didn't want to mm. give it up. Sure. Um, and so I more or less just kept on and hoped for the best. And true enough, it just went away. Uh, yes. Mysteriously. Yep. And, and, uh, and it often does. You know, these the, these things very often will. I um, say, so, you know, when I, um, I mean, I'm, I have this running joke that uh, whenever I walk into a room, someone immediately gets injured. Um, because <laughs> that seems to be my um, my desk. Yeah, you know, I think it's possibly because of the sports I hang ar hang around with. But um, uh, I mean, sometimes you know, when I go to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or something, people will often come and they pick my brains about a particular injury they've got or like that and um, you know sometimes people will say to me oh my shoulder's been a bit niggly this week and usually my response to that will be okay here's one basic thing one basic exercise that you can do go away have a go at that see if it settles down mm -hmm. if it doesn't then come back and see me um, but I think a lot of the time you know it's very often it will settle down yes. and like I say whether it's got whether it's to do with the exercise or whether it would have just settled down anyway. Um, One just, you just never say, knows. Yes, absolutely. So my my first answer is, well, let's let's do the, you know, we'll keep it very simple, do that, and then if it needs it, we can take a proper look. Um, yes. Uh, in mixed martial arts, as in other sports, there's mm -hmm. been quite a problem of doping, hasn't there? And there's also another mm. interesting problem that's arisen, which is rather uh, fashionable at the moment, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, it says in the, I, I read just recently, in the 2018 Connecticut State Track and Field Championships of the six medals in the men's and women's 100 metres, five were biologically male. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 one thing I've kept out of very strictly mm. on Twitter is the turf wars. <laughs> but but yes. it, 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 it must be a, a, quite a problem, I think, to know that, to deal with that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think they're two, they're two quite different issues, actually. Um, I mean, oh, the doping and, yes, the, and the, yeah. the trends, um, yes, quite different. Yeah. I mean, I think, as far as doping goes, it's a problem across sport in general. Um, I am not sure there are any very good answers. I think it's one of the difficulties with taking sport to such a high stakes level. You know, when there is so much riding on one particular event, it's always going to select the people who are prepared to be a little bit morally flexible. <laughs> um, I love that expression, crooked. <laughs> um, and like I say, the, the, the problem is, you know, it's whatever you try and do, you're always going to select the people who are prepared to take that chance. Um, so, uh, I mean, I've been quite critical of policies in mixed martial arts when it comes to doping, because I, th I think the, the sanctions when people are caught are not strong enough to really dissuade people from, from taking a chance and, you know, um, trying to get away with it. So, I've always said, you, you need to have far stronger sanctions if you're going to stand any chance of trying to... Uh, um, persuade people that it's not worth the risk. Um, I mean, the UFC has um, changed its policy in recent years. They've become, they've, they've instituted some much tougher drug testing and things like that. So I think that is, that is a step forward. Um, you know, I, I, I wish that had been the case when I was competing, um, but I'm, I'm glad they're, they're now starting to take it seriously. Whether that's enough, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, um, but, uh, but I think it, I mean it is a difficulty when, whenever you've got something where there is, you've got a lot riding on the outcome, and that is nowhere more the case than it is for fighters, because uh, fighting, you know, every fight could be make or break for your career. You know, I think um, it's it's such a high pressured sport. I mean, in tennis, if you have a bad season. But then come back next season and do well, people have forgotten it. In fighting, you know, if you have one bad fight, people will still be talking about it ten years later, you know, yeah. because, you know, it's, uh, so, oh, they, they, but they got beat by so-and-so. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, um, it's, uh, you know, every, every fight, there's, there's so much pressure there. Uh, I, can, I can certainly understand why the temptation is there. Um, but what you do about it, <coughs> so I, I don't think I have any very good answers. Um, and what about yeah. trans competitors? Now, well, still biologically male. I, th I think this kind of when you when you start looking at this, it starts to illustrate how. I mean, the, the purpose behind having gender categories. It's the same as the purpose behind having weight categories in combat sports, for example. It's so that you can compare like with like um, to enable or to give more people the opportunity to participate and to, to compete. And once upon a time, people were only ever interested in, you know, heavyweight male fighters. You know, we just want to see the, 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 the best people out there. And the best people out there are always going to be the, the large men um, when it comes to sports. Uh, and then, over, you know, they started int introducing different weight classes because people recognised that actually there were some highly skilled fighters who were smaller, but when you put them in with the bigger fighters, all other things being equal, the, the bigger fighter is always going to beat the smaller one. You know, obviously, you know, sometimes things aren't equal. Sometimes you have, if the smaller fighter has more skill, for example, then maybe they can cause an upset. But overall, you know, once you get, once you're looking at the very best people in the world, um, size is an advantage. And in the same way, you know, we know that um, men, because of the extra testosterone, you know, the extra size and strength, are going to have an advantage over women when you're looking at the best people in the world. Um, so the idea with, with gender categories in any sport is to enable more participation, mm. basically. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that in much the same way that weight categories, ca the, can be 
there's a blurred boundary between the weight categories. You know, there's the difference between someone who's just over the borderline versus somebody who's just under the borderline. You know, the, the, actually, there's not that much difference. It's, mm. it's a slightly artificial boundary that you're creating mm. there. And I think what we're starting to understand now is that gender is not, um, is to some extent, is to some extent not as um, natural a boundary as we once thought it was. So, I mean, for example, there, there are natural variations that um, some athletes have, which mean that, you know, for example, some people, some um, people who are classed as biologically women produce large amounts of extra testosterone, for example. Um, which then gives them advan an advantage over some of the other women in the category. But then you start to look at them and you say, well, some women naturally produce more testosterone than others anyway. Mm. So really, we're not comparing like with like. So maybe we should have um, categories that distinguish based on testosterone, testosterone levels. Um, so it all gets very complicated. When you, when you start looking at it like that, you say, well, um, what... How do, how do we divide this up so that we, we're comparing like with like? Um, and, I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, splitting it by gender is, is just a, a very rough and ready way of doing it. Um, but when you start to um, look at high-stakes competition, there's a lot on the line. We're looking at professional athletes, the best in the world. Those divisions start to look a bit... You know, it, it starts to not quite make sense. And again, how you, how you solve that problem, I'm not entirely sure because, I mean, I'm absolutely for inclusivity. You know, I, I would like as many people as possible to be able to compete. I would like as many people as possible to be able to compete. I mean, especially in combat sports, it's important that you've got um, good matchmaking, that you're matching like with like, that people have similar levels of strength and skill. Um, for safety, if nothing, nothing else. Um, so, how you ensure that when you've got um, uh, maybe a, a gender spectrum that's not quite as black and white as we once saw it? Um, yeah, things are difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not going to pretend yeah. that I have an easy answer to that question. It has always struck me as a great advantage of combat sports is that you, mm. it doesn't matter whether you're a, a four foot eleven woman mm. or a, a six foot eight man, you can be matched against somebody appropriate. Yes. Yeah. But it does put a tremendous it's, uh, yeah. responsibility on the matchmaker. Well, this is it. It's Not like least what because do, you could you know, break your neck if, if it was. Yeah. I mean, the, the the question is, what does you know? What does a fair fight mean? What does that look like? You know. So same same size, same gender, you know, same level of strength. You know, perhaps we should be measuring that. But then, so well, strength is something you can improve. You know, so it is. Do do we want to allow people to go away and improve their strength? And <laughs> yes. well, you know, of course they're going to do that. Um, but what are fair ways of improving it? And what are unfair ways of improving it? It's. Um, it's I I don't think it's. The trouble is, the trouble is that with any issue like this, it tends to, unfortunately, degenerate into a bit of a shouting match yeah. a lot of the time. Uh, people who, are, uh, um, and a lot of the, a lot of the, the nuance and the, um, that that can get lost. And I think the, the, it, it's it, it's fundamentally it's a difficult question. I think, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. And I think. I don't think people t taking a position on one side or the other and yelling at each other, I think that's generating much more heat than light. Yes. I, I think MMA certainly has still, I think, an image problem. I mean, the trouble is the only sort of combat sports my wife is aware of are of something like last night's fight, but two, two, mm. uh, two very strong men beat the daylights out of each mm. other and, and, and with frequently with knockouts mm. uh, and she has see that as being brutal whereas at the lower levels it seems to me much more acceptable um, I think uh, because you mm. know 
getting concussed too often or getting your neck bent in mm. MMA is, is, is not at all good for you and it's potentially quite serious. No, no. no I mean, nobody like knows say, quite how serious. Yes. Is. Well, I mean, as with a lot of sports, there are, uh, um, you know, there, there's obviously the potential for injury. I think people see combat sports as different because they perceive it as, well, if you're intending to cause injury, that's somehow different from if the injury is being caused incidentally while you're trying to do something else. Uh, I mean, my point has always been that an injury is an injury, and whether somebody's intending to cause it or not, ultimately doesn't really matter to the severity of the injury. Um, yes, and I think people uh, are wrong if they think that um, in rugby people aren't intending to cause injury. <laughs> anyway. that's, that's another fair point, I think. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, at, least, at least they have plausible deniability. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yes, no, I, th I think... Um, so my, my point is, well... You know, lots, with lots of sports, and I mean, rugby is a good example because that's another contact sport. They have um, their own problems with with injuries, and you know, I mean, it, it, there's a, there's a large overlap actually between rugby injuries and mixed martial arts injuries. Mm -hmm. We tend to see similar sorts of uh, problems um, in in a lot of areas, but um, it's where were we going with that? Um, a, uh, no, I think I think um, the the perception of combat sports as being particularly brutal. I think I mean that that stems down to a few things. I think I mean one is the way they're marketed, um, because in a sense. Uh, there is there is advantage to be had from marketing them as brutal because that appeals to certainly some people. Um, some people. It's uh, um, I, I think I mean humans have a or I mean I, I won't speak for humans in general, but a lot of humans have a fascination with violence. You know, oh, it's yeah. it's something it's that um, slightly taboo kind of and again because. We, I think that the, as we become increasingly unfamiliar with it in our day-to-day -day lives, it's something that people are perhaps even more fascinated with. Um, you know, when, when you take that out of... I mean, sorry, you know, fortunately, we, we actually live in a, a remarkably civilised society compared to, uh, um, you know, humans for tens of thousands of years of our evolutionary history. You know, in general, we're, we're probably less likely to encounter violence in our day-to-day -day life um, than humans have ever been. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that uh, as, a, as a, someone living in a, a Western civilization in the in the 21st century, you know, we're, we we do in the grand scheme of things very well. But uh, but I think one of the maybe potentially side effects of that. Is that um, people are still very interested when they see physical conflict, you know, mm. report whether it's reports of it on the news or um, in the form of contact contact sports. Um, so I think there is when you're looking at the people who are marketing these things, there's always that tension between wanting to appear civilised and, you know, this is a legitimate sport and you know, we're looking after our athletes and all of those things, but at the same time not, qu not wanting to make it too civilised. Yes. Um, not, not wanting to make it so civilised that it loses that edge that has, has an appeal to it. So I think there's that aspect of it. And obviously for some people, they're then going to perceive it as... Um, because not everyone has draws that line in the same place, some people are going to perceive it as unacceptably um, violent or whatever. Yes, um, I, I think perhaps that's why I've always rather preferred mm -hmm. amateur sport because mm -hmm. they're not as good. They're not going to kill each other so often. Well, and uh, and but but in particular, you mm -hmm. know, they're doing it because they want want to, to rather because than not. Yeah, I mean, paid. my my argument has always been that any, I mean. It's maybe less true than it used to be, but certainly when I was involved, um, you didn't get involved in mixed martial arts just because you wanted to make money. Because no, no, I'm sure, it, especially I mean, as a woman, no doubt. 
Well, as any athlete, I mean, if, when you look at what these fighters are making by and large, I mean, a few occasionally, you know, a very small handful um, do all right out of it. But the vast majority do not. Um, and I think um, that's, uh, that's maybe not appreciated um, by, by enough people. But I think, uh, so, I mean, may, boxing might be a bit different. Um, and certainly sort of, I mean, when you get onto things like NFL, that's a, a whole different story. But for mixed martial arts, um, I'm not saying there aren't any fighters who are doing it with a hope of getting massively rich. But I think if they are, it's they're they're buying the worst lottery ticket in the world. Yes. Um, it's uh, because it, it, the the odds are not in your favour. Um, yes. So back to this pain thing, just briefly mm. before mm. we wrap it up. Mm. And I, I was at a meeting of the North British Pain mm. Society. Mm. Which is Oh, it's a great, quaint name, yes. the Scottish pain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is funny. <laughs> uh, and it was very interesting, because to listen to these guys, you'd think they could fix pain. Mm, yeah. There were psychologists talking about biopsychosocial models and all this sort of stuff. Mm. But no, no one seemed to admit that it was essentially an unsolved problem. I mean, drugs don't work very well, most people. Um, now, no, I, no, I, no, I, nothing I, much there. And certainly having a psychologist say, it's, "Don't worry, it's all biopsychosocial." We are I, 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 now. Now, I, I, I take particular issue with that because I, I think there is a, a, a misunderstanding there. That I think the idea that um, I mean there is there is certainly a psychological component to pain because you can have people with um, actually quite a lot of damage. But in the right circumstances, they won't necessarily um, perceive that as very painful. So, I mean, for example, if you, in, in a mixed martial arts fight, you know, when you get punched in the face, in a mixed martial arts fight, it, you don't, it doesn't register, you know. Or yeah. Certainly, that, oh, was, that, no, was, that, was, that was my experience. It yeah, didn't really it register it. because, you know, there's... Because you, the, the frame of mind you're in and, you know, the, you know, perhaps all the adrenaline going on, um, I mean, that you don't perceive it as painful. Whereas if somebody came up to me and did that to me in the street, I'm sure it would be very painful. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, so I agree entirely. I, I think but this so is we, know, we know that there is a psychological component to pain. Now, the problem comes where people take that to mean that, oh, that means you, if you can uh, just think a bit more positively, it'll go away. That is absolutely not the case. You know, yeah. I mean, pain lives in your pain is all in your head because that's where your brain lives, and you know, your your brain is um, responsible for that pain perception. However, that doesn't mean that you can make it go away by just thinking more positively about it. Absolutely. Um, and I think this is where both um, patients sort of hear this incorrectly. And perhaps a lot of therapists aren't explaining it very well. Um, so, I mean, I think there is definitely, I mean, I don't think the problem is with the biopsychosocial model. I think actually there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of truth to that because I think um, sort of mental state impacts on pain, pain impacts on mental state. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to patients about um, how they feel about their pain. So it's not just the pain itself, it's what effect that's having on their daily lives. And again, I mean, sometimes I have patients who come in um, and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time, you know, talking about how they're feeling because they don't have anyone else they can talk to about that. And they find that that in itself makes it feel easier to deal with. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm claiming that, okay, well, if we just get your mental state right, your pain's going to go away, yeah. because it doesn't. It doesn't. It's, it's not like that. Um, so I think saying that there are psychological influences on pain and saying that we can cure pain by just thinking more positively are two very, very different things. Yes. Yes, I guess I wouldn't draw any sharp line between no. psychology and, and, and mental 
as a sort of it's all, no, no. It's all, yes. It's all brain damage. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely, absolutely. Um, the psychologists like to draw that. Well, we it's, all know how reproducible psychological findings are. <laughs> as with so many things, yes. Um, I think it's, and again, I mean, there is a lot of difference between individual patients. Uh, this is something that you, you appreciate when you work with individuals, is how different people are from each other and how different their responses are yes. to that pain. I mean, like I say, I might have one person who's, uh, um, you know, feeling very overwhelmed by it all and, you know, it's, there's a lot of anxiety and depression and they're very, um, there are a lot of psychological issues going on. And then I might, I might have another patient who really is a very, um, a very biomechanical problem, you know, it's maybe they got, uh, you know, they got thrown awkwardly and their back's hurting and there's, I'm not saying there isn't a psychological component, because obviously there will be, but it's not affecting them in the same way as it is with somebody else. Yes, I, I think uh -huh. the sports thing is a little different. I, mean, I agree, yeah. you, don't, you don't notice it so much. Rugby, mm. you get kicked and be bleeding and you only notice it oh, when, yes. you, and, I mean, when I, you come off. And I think some people have... Um, uh, I mean, even in day-to-day -day life, I think some, pe some people are, m and again, I'm going to be careful how I say this, but some people um, are more reactive to potentially painful stimuli than others. Um, and mm -hmm, maybe. Some, people f w some people will perceive something as painful that somebody else would maybe just find a bit uncomfortable. Yep. Um, so I, th I think, again, mental state does make a huge difference, but what we can do about that is, um, is a much more difficult question. I think you know, anyone who's too confident in their ability to, um, to change that, I think is... Uh, and again, I mean, this, is, this is one of the, the issues I take with a lot of the, the debate and the dialogue about this at the moment, is that there seem to be a lot of people who are very sure of themselves when it comes to this sort of topic. And I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm always suspicious of anyone who's too sure of themselves um, when it comes to this sort of thing, because I don't think that the evidence warrants that. Um, yes. yes, the only thing I feel sure about is that the evidence is usually lousy on most of these questions. Yes, um, but again, it, it, it's, I mean, it's the same thing when we're talking about diet, for example. Um, I think we have ve it's very hard to sort of pin down precisely what you should do but at the same time you have to do something certainly with diet you know we have to eat something yes so yes. we may not have perfect evidence for what you should do but um, if you wait until that evidence comes out before you have lunch you're going to be very hungry um, exactly yes well um, most people wouldn't Quite rightly so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, we have to take our best guess with with a lot of these things. Um, yes, but I mean, I'm I'm very much in favour of looking at the evidence that is there. Um, again, we I think we've got to take that with a pin pinch of salt. And people very commonly um, take the evidence as being more certain than it warrants. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to ex be able to extrapolate from that and make sensible guesses. Um. Yes, I guess so. Um. Um, and the last thing I'd like to talk about is how little is known about safety in, in, in any sort of contact support. Because people mm. don't keep records. I did try to look at the risk. In various sports, but the numbers simply are not there because nobody has kept proper records and nobody does proper follow-ups. I mean, I'm I'm a hundred percent for people taking mm -hmm. risks if that's what yes. they want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a few myself, mm. at least in boats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And indeed in boxing, as in mm -hmm. that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. 
But the only time I would be knocked out unconscious for any length of time was falling off a bike, actually. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, but you, you've been knocked out mm -hmm. twice, haven't you, in competition? Yes, a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And nobody still knows whether that has a serious long-term consequences or not. I mean, I'm reasonably sure it's not good for you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, it's not good for you, but it, it's a ha the, the, the question is, it, how bad is it? Um, if you want to, yeah. if, a, if, if a, you know, your, your son comes along, mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. your daughter, and says, I want to learn MMA, you should be able to give them some advice as to the risk they're taking. I mean, and, it, and you can't actually. Yes, I mean, it, it, it would be, it would be nice to have that information. I agree. Um, I think, I mean, like I say, I, I, I don't think MMA is particularly unique in that respect. I think with a lot of things, um, it is very difficult to quantify these risks. There, there are a lot of risks out there that we either don't have the information or um, it's because of the nature of the risk, it's inherently hard to quantify. I think that's something that, again, this is unfortunately one of the one of the difficulties of of being human is uh, that a lot of the time we are basing our decisions on very imperfect information. Um, yes. What usually seems to be mm. missing is the denominator. Mm. How many people are at risk? Actually, that's a very common problem. It's the same as the reason that. Type one error rates aren't the same as <laughs> mm. as false positive risks. Mm. It's all in the denominator, and that's a serious problem. But I, I think it's probably also the partly the problem of university policies. They're only rewarding short-term work. Somebody ought to be starting a prospective cohort study with, yeah. with good um, records and, and a, some sort of comparable group and follow them up till they yeah. die. And of course, it still won't tell you about causality. No. But it, no, would, no. it would still, I think, it could be quite well that being knocked out a couple of times when you're young has no effect at all on your longevity. And that, that would be very valuable information. That could come out of that, whether it comes out that way, I mm. don't know. But it could come out of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Again, I think, I mean, the difficulty is also quantifying what you mean by, because um, I, mean, I think some of the evidence that's coming out now suggests that the problematic thing isn't just being knocked out, it's the accumulation of sub-concussive blows mm. over time. And that's, again, much harder to quantify because who's going to sit there and count how many times a fighter gets punched in the head, much less measure how hard they got punched in the head in every training session and every fight that they do during the course of their life. It's not going to happen. With the best will in the world, that is never going to happen. Um, so, no. I mean, I'm not saying that that's a reason not to do a study um, on the things that we can easily quantify. Um, but I'm saying that even if we did that, it would still give us very relatively poor information when it comes to deciding what the risk actually is um, or what the risky part of that is. And I think I mean, people are, yeah, are starting now to do more research on, um, uh, on concussion in general. There has been quite a lot that's come out recently that I've, that I've, been, I've been following. Um, I mean, I... I but it's not, it's not followed up. I mean, clearly, most people recover from, from concussion with very minimal mm -hmm. or no I mean, I, th I, th I think there have... But the question is, do they yeah. die earlier? Do they get dementia? I mean, I think, I think there have been some longer-term studies that have been conducted recently. I mean, this is one of those things that... Actually, if, I, if I'm completely honest, I try to avoid looking at too closely um, because otherwise I'll worry about it. Um, and... I, uh, yeah, so, so uh, while I'm, a, I'm aware that there, there is some research being done there and some of the stuff that's coming out is actually a bit worrying, um, the, I, I don't know the details and I deliberately don't know the details 
Um, <laughs> Deliberately, um, oh dear, I, this, is, this is not so good. <laughs> well, um, I mean, again, if, if, I was, if I was providing advice to people about concussion, that would be a different thing, and I would, I would have to familiarise myself with the, uh, with the latest and the evidence, but um, that's not so much part of what I do. Um, yes. Because um, it seems to me that certainly if there's a long-term effect on your brain, it hasn't affected you much yet. It was very well, well illustrated in a, a Twitter discussion we had where someone <laughs> described something as the best statistics to statistics question ever. Oh, dispute is really statistics. <laughs> but, but never mind. If you choose an answer to this question at random, what is the chance that you will be correct? A, 50%, B, 25%, C, 60%, D, 50%. Uh, <laughs> certainly in the conversations that I took part in, you, you, were, you were the only person who well, categorised it correctly in the first place. I just said it's, it's, mm. th there isn't a real question there. But you said it's a self-referential question. Which you added to your favourite source. <laughs> <laughs> when, did, when did you first come across a self referential Well, I mean, it's uh, it's the old uh, logic problems, isn't it? You know, the it, it's like when uh, uh, I think it's Bertrand Russell, is it? the the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, and you know, so other such self referential uh, concepts. Um, I mean, maybe it's a logician thing. Um, maybe, maybe that's, okay. but um, I mean, you have the, you know, the, the, the good old logic problems such as, uh, what was that? Oh, that's a good one, um, yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's the, the archetypical, the, is the set of all sets that are not members of themselves a member of itself? Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I recall reading about Russell talking yeah. about that. Yes. Um, and I, I mean, actually, that that led to some interesting um, areas of maths and, and logic. So, uh, I mean, that's something that I got I got fascinated with when I was a teenager. That was things. Um, there's a, a logician called Raymond Raymond Smullyan, and he did a series of books. Um, I had, it was just full of that sort of logic pro puzzle and I remember being a kid and going on family holidays and taking these books on the plane with me and just sort of working through these series of logic puzzles um, and I think again this is one of the this places. This was his age? Pardon? I, I was uh, maybe 15, 16, something like that um, and I, I, I remember, I mean this was maybe one of the things that kind of really um, grabbed me about logic as a, a subject. Um, that's a pretty remarkable thing for a 15-year-old. Like I say, I was a very nerdy 15-year-old. Um, uh, I'm not. Uh, I think that. I'm not sure whether that's good or not. Um, it just. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I don't know about any moral value, but mm. it's certainly impressive to me. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I think we've probably exhausted most of the mm. things we can talk about at considerable mm. length. Actually. But, so. but, but thank you very much, because it still uh, baffles me that to, to meet somebody who is so much smarter than me in, in three different areas, really, well, in sports, in, I, 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 I'm, in, I'm not in I'm not sure smart is a, a linear quantity. Um. No. <laughs> if, I, if I have a talent in science, it's picking it's good collaborators, actually. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think there are, there are so many different factors that uh, uh, that come into what we regard as smart. You know, I can think of any number of people who are better than me at particular things or in particular areas. Um, I mean, in fact, I, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, in thinking how much smarter other people are than. Uh, um, how much better somebody else can do one particular thing than I can, um, but I guess we, you know, it's everyone has their talents in in individual areas. Um. <coughs> yes, the, the the only thing that I find 
mildly irritating in some of our discussions is your unwillingness to, <laughs> to criticise people I would regard as outright quacks. But, um, I think it's... I, th I, th I think... Um, I'm wondering how best to how best to, to put this. I find that certainly as a clinician, because I work with patients, the important thing to me is to be, being able to connect with the person in front of me. I think mm -hmm. unless you can, um, when I talk to somebody, it's important that I make them feel heard and that their experience is important to me. Now, if I have somebody who comes in and said. I had acupuncture and it was great, it really made me feel better. If the first thing I say is acupuncture doesn't work, the evidence says so, I've immediately lost that patient. Yes, I see. There's, there's that, um, and it doesn't matter what I say after that because that patient is not going to trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because actually their experience was, they had a good experience with it. Now we can talk about biases, we can talk about, oh well was it down to the acupuncture or was it down to something else? Or maybe, you know, uh, the, the acupuncture for some reason, the experience of that helped them to relax and they felt better. I don't know, I don't know. Um, but if I go in with a position that, oh but the evidence says that doesn't work, then I've, I've immediately lost them. Um, and the same is true of, you know, n numerous other things. Now. That's true when I talk to somebody individually. And most therapists will say, yes, but I'm not going to say that to somebody if I'm talking to them individually. But then my next point is, what I put out in public, whether that's via interview or on social media, that is a public channel. Yeah. And yes. my potential patients are going to see that and they're going to make a judgment about me as a person. And is that somebody I'm going to be comfortable being treated by? And if I come across as very shouty and judgmental, that will affect the way that those people relate to me. And it, it may appeal to some people. Some people might like that. But that's not the way I want to come across as a clinician. And I think, again, I think people's experience um, is important. And I think it's important that they feel validated in that experience. Now, that's not me saying that I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not making a judgment on whether that particular thing caused that particular improvement or anything like that. You know, they, they may have some, some views about the way the world works that I don't share. But I don't think it's my position to... I don't need to tell them that they're wrong, you know. So, I mean, there, there may very well be some things that we disagree about, but the important thing is, based on what you've told me, what do I think is going to be the best course of action to That's get you to point, where yes. you want to be? You probably need an anonymous social media account where you can say what you want. Because the problem, the problem for you is the fact that you're... As the private opinions are not uh, not private; they're on social media. I mean, I, th I think they're public, and they're, yeah. they're not. That's not really separable from. But I think I think the thing is, this is this is patience. this is true. This is true in a wider context as well. I think, you know, cause, because we all have our social media persona, and I think people do form judgments about us as a person based on that social media persona. And I think it's very easy to. Um, like I say, because of the, the increasing polarisation, I think, of, of some of these topics, it, it's easy to come across as quite shouty and intimidating. And I think I was made aware of this when I talked to somebody who, um, who'd seen something I'd posted and sort of said, I think he said something, oh, you're not at all the way I would have expected based on post and I think that sort of suddenly made me aware that actually you know the, the way that I come across that matters um, so 
I don't know. I also, I also think that uh, I, I wonder how useful it is sometimes um, getting into a very polarised argument where people are. I, I don't think. It's it's like the, that XKCD cartoon, isn't it? Where you know, somebody is wrong on the internet. Um, I mean, I, I, I wonder how many people actually change their views by being told that they're wrong on the internet. <laughs> um, I don't know. No, um, I think I don't want to yeah. change the view of a homeopath that they mm. should be free to carry on, <laughs> even if I think it's fraud. But I don't want money spent on it. I don't want my money spent on it. I don't want any guess money spent on it. And that's, that's mm. it, 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 the person I'm aiming at is the Minister of Health, not the homeopath. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think that's... So I, I think yeah. that's... Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think there is there is definitely a time and a place for that. There's, and I mean, as you said, when it comes to sort of public spending decisions and things like that, you know, I, I, can, I can see the argument for, for making that case and for making that case strongly. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, but I'm saying that a lot of the debates that I see go on on social media, I do wonder what is gained by them, um, apart from... because. One of the things that I see is that sometimes the longer these debates go on, people might start with a slight difference of opinion, but actually sometimes the longer they go on, the more people dig themselves into their trenches and actually become more polarised. And I, I've noticed this sometimes when I've sort of started out with a, a slight difference of opinion from somebody and then they've started, you know, getting quite um, uh, aggressive about their views. And actually, I've, you know, I found myself becoming sort of even more... Sort of firmly opposed to what they're saying when I didn't start out that way. So it's the what they call the, that <coughs> backfire effect. And I, I see that a lot. I see that a lot. Mm. Um, so I mean, again, it's not. I'm not saying that it's never appropriate, but I do wonder sometimes whether um, a more collaborative tone of discussion would result in a different outcome. I think it's a, sometimes, a, 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 sometimes in a, some contexts. I, I think uh, a discussion with a homeopath is likely. No, a discussion I mean, with a, a yeah. UKIP member is very unlikely <laughs> to resolve anything. Well, you say that, you say that, um, but I've I've had discussions with people who've started out um, sort of with very politically different views. I mean, I'm, I I don't know if they're an, a UKIP member or anything like that, but um, who started out quite strongly opposed and. You know, um, and I do think that having there are ways of having a discussion which are more likely to lead to in, to lead to people changing their views than yeah. than others. I think um, I think it depends how you. I I think it's important to give people the space to change their views without feeling, um, what's the word, um, without feeling that they'd be looked down on or mocked or ridiculed, you know, if you, I think sometimes sort of giving people the, the space to, to do that, I mean sometimes, sometimes it won't work, I mean the, the, there is never any guarantees with these things, but I do think that, um, it well, can make a difference. Uh, yes, I mean, like I say, I, th I think I think a l I'm not sure that shouting ever resolves anything. But no, well, uh, I got into rather accidentally because mm. I'd replied to something mm. else into a discussion with uh, some ardent mm. Brexiteers just a couple mm. of nights ago mm. on Twitter, and they were shouty, but yeah. I tried to be quietly reasonable, mm. and, I, <laughs> and I wasted time on it. But yeah. it's no doubt then. Mm. That very much is their usual change. What the hell? Well, um, yeah. anyway, the reason mm -hmm. that I, some, as I said, it started at the beginning, and some of my sceptical friends mm. are, are a little puzzled by the fact that I have respect for an osteopath, but it's, uh, it's uh, not only your music and your sport and your other things. But it's also that you do seem to me to stick pretty much to evidence. I mean, I just read two of your
blog posts um, one on is running bad for my knees and are you sure I don't need mm. uh, an MRI scan and I, they both seem to me exemplary they could have been written by any um, well, me medical yeah, person I mean I, I, I like I always try to be... Now, I'm not going to say that everything I do is always supported by evidence, because there are some times when I'll say, well, you know what, I'm not sure, but let's take a punt on this. Um, or how about taking a punt on this? I mean, it, it's always up to, up to the patient, of course. Um, but, uh, but I always say it's important to start by knowing what the evidence says and what it doesn't say. Yes. And I think... Oh, no, I'm sure that's... That's... A, that, that's if you're going to take an educated guess, you need to you need to know what is known and what is not known to start with, um, and that's why I mean some of the information I put out there, um, and again a lot of the time I mean I'm one of the reasons that I think it's important that people like me do stay in this profession um, is that if I wasn't here, then if somebody is looking for a professional to go to who, you know, manual therapy, there are a lot of people out there who are prepared to, to sell the, let's say, slightly more, um, more dubious narratives. Yes. Um, <laughs> and who maybe aren't quite as scrupulous about trying to keep people out of the clinic wherever possible. Because, um, I mean, my, my position is always, I want to keep people out of my clinic. Um, if I can, you know, if uh, the, the the less I see you, the happier I am. Um, and I've always found that actually, if you try and stick to that, you'll never be out of work um, as, as an osteopath. You know, if you if you do that consistently, um, you'll never you'll never manage it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I th I think it's the problem is if you haven't got somebody. Who understand? I mean, because as you, as you know yourself, you know, if you're in pain, you'll people will very often sort of grasp at straws. They'll they'll grasp mm. anything. You they'll know, it's like anything. they'll go to go to whoever's out there who's who's uh, you know promising they can help. So I think it's important that there are people there that they can go to who do have a good grasp of the evidence, but at the same time are prepared to say, okay, well, I think it would be reasonable to try this in your case. Yes. You know, I can't prove that this works, but I think this would be a reasonable thing to try. No. Um, I mean, in fact, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me. I obviously don't know mm -hmm. if 90% of your patients get better anyway, regression to the mean. But it doesn't really matter, actually, that much, because you're doing the best you can, and just having them then come to talk to you about it must be well, uh, I mean, a little helpful to them in some sense. Yes, and I think the, the other thing is, I mean, I, I try to provide helpful advice. So when it comes to things like, you know, for example, well, what should I do at work in order to um, enable me to, to do my job without it causing me more pain or making it worse? Or is it okay if I go back to my sport? Or I've got a marathon next weekend. Can I do that or is it going to make it worse? Mm. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, when people come in and they say to me, this is a bit sore, is it okay to go to the gym? And I'll say, actually, I don't think that's going to do you any harm. That's fine. Mm. And that's all they want to hear. You know, yeah. it's, they just wanted that piece of advice. Mm. Um, and occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll pick up things which are potentially more serious that somebody who didn't have as much time to do a full examination missed. Mm. So I had an elderly gentleman with myeloma recently. Mm. Um, and he'd been sent away by you know, the GP with paracetamol. Um, and again, that was based on what the GP could find out in a seven-minute consultation, I can understand why they did that. Now, because I had a much longer time to spend with them, I could see that there was something that was really not right here, and actually I think we need to get you back to the GP. Let's write you a letter, send you back. Um, GP read the letter, obviously sort of reassessed, sent them off the test and things, and then it turned out. But, but I mean, this is one of the, again, when, 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 I talk, when I talk to people about what osteopaths do, I would say it, it's, it's, 
we don't just rub backs. It's not just about you know, you know somebody who's got back pain and magically getting rid of that back pain. We do all these other things as well. You know, we're, we're screening for the serious conditions um, and making sure that that person gets referred appropriately. We're you know, helping people to get back to their activities, giving them good advice about what's okay to do, what they should avoid, how they can build back up to doing what they want to do in a way that uh, doesn't cause them unacceptable levels of pain. Um, you know, and all of those things as well, you know. Um, so I always think of myself much more as a guide than as a, um, you know, somebody... Uh, I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to, if somebody comes in, I'm not necessarily going to magically fix their pain, but I can help to guide them through that. Yes, um, yes. And yeah. I think, like I say, you know, if there aren't people out there do it, like me doing that, who, you know, I do care about the evidence, I do care about doing the right thing for my patients, because, you know, I, I, um, I mean, I, I will genuinely lose sleep over whether... One particular patient is, you know, is this the best course of action? You know, and I'll, I'll go away and I'll worry about that. And I think the fact that that's what makes me good at what I do. And I think you need somebody who is going to go away and worry about whether do, whether this is actually the right thing to do, rather than somebody who's blithely confident that they are doing the right thing, whether that person happens to call themselves a chiropractor or an evidence-based physio. Anyone who's too confident that their way is the one true way that's going to work for everyone, I think, has the potential to cause problems. Um, yes. I mean, you seem to function, to me, like essentially like mm -hmm. an evidence-based physio, but like a better word is, of course, any physios go for acupuncture and stuff mm -hmm. as well now. So then once I'm entirely blameless in my eyes. But but you uh, seem not to have any vestige of the the alternative medicines, which is osteopathy is still unfortunately classified as generally. Uh, but but you you don't seem to practice it in that way. Many do, but I I try not to think of myself as alternative. You know I th I I try. Th 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 I, I promise that, you know, when the evidence changes, we change our views along with that, you know, I think. Yeah. But that relies on having a good understanding of what the evidence actually says, um, which, unfortunately, not everyone does. No. I find that all too, all too often these days, people don't read the evidence. People read the Twitter summary of the evidence. Um, yes. I think or that, they read the abstract of the paper. Yes, and, yeah. Uh, Without yes. Well, I mean, I think I think we've we've gone one level further back from that. I think people read the Twitter summary of the abstract nowadays. Um, mm. They don't even get as far as the abstract a lot of the time. Mm. Um, but uh, yes, I yeah. spent more time reading papers on alternative mm. medicine than I care to think about mm. it because it's usually a terrible waste of time. You've got to read it to see the flaws, mm. <laughs> mm. which they usually plenty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we'd better stop. This has gone on for a very long time, hasn't it? But it's certainly it's been, been very It's been a very interview. interesting conversation. Thank you. So, and uh, yeah, no, it's it's always good to always good to chat. I so I, I, I do I do find conversations in person. I think are uh, they're always better than um, the social media version. I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She did a lot of music. She achieved grade, grade seven cello, grade eight piano, and then she went on and did a diploma in piano. And she played with the Reading Youth Orchestra at the Royal Albert Hall. And she was offered a place at uh, Trinity College, Cambridge to read maths. Nothing pleased her more, especially since the school suggested she was being a bit ambitious in, in applying. Her PhD graduation at Manchester. Consistent theme that runs through Rosie's life is, is winning. I mean, Rosie, Rosie has a need to, to win. The physics teacher has commented, Rosemary has a 
meticulous approach to her studies and nothing short of perfection satisfies her. She ends by saying, I wish her happiness in her future studies. It's interesting that she should say that because probably happiness is something that can sort of um, be difficult to attain with a person who is seeking perfection because if you, the very fact that you're seeking perfection means that you never achieve it and so that, therefore you can never be completely, completely happy, doesn't it? Okay, folks, uh, so here I am at the one belay point down from the top, fourth belay point. Um, so I've got one more pitch to climb. Um, Steve is Steve is down there. He's just going to second that pitch that I just climbed. And then we're nearly there. Get in there. This is taking a little bit longer than we thought it was going, going to. But we're... Um, we will get there, we will get there. It's a nice view out there. Looking down.